Welcome to the Grow Your Business and Grow Your Wealth podcast with Gary Helt. Gary is an expert in helping business owners put together a plan that will provide a better future for their businesses, themselves, and their families. On the podcast, Gary interviews other professionals who share his vision, and together they share secrets and strategies any business owner can use to build a better financial foundation for your business and your life. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today, our guest is Eric Rotman, and he is the CEO of BFG Financial Advisors and quite the accomplished uh, author. How are you doing this morning? I'm well, Gary. Thanks for having me. So, Eric, tell us um, how you got into the financial um, arena, because uh, that's not what you went to school for. No, no, I was uh, I studied English and psychology, which is not necessarily the way that uh, that that paves a path to financial services. But, but I actually took my first job out of college at a broker term in the legal department because, like lots of English majors, I was thinking about law school and I wanted right. to work for a while first. Uh, and I had done some internships and I got an opportunity to work for a major broker firm in their in their home office in their operations office in the legal department to cut my teeth a little bit. And I thought I was going to go on and do wills and trusts or tax law or something really right. fun like that. Uh, and I fell in love with the brokerage business. I fell in love with the financial world uh, and having applied to law schools, um, gotten accepted to law schools and even paid a deposit for law school. I didn't go. And to this day, I think it's the best decision I've made professionally because I love what I'm doing. Uh, and it, it worked out well. So um, I spent that time at the brokerage firm um, and decided I wanted to go into, um, into essentially starting a practice. And when I did, um, this, was the, this was the early 90s. And, um, you know, there were only a couple of paths into our profession at the time. And one of them that was probably the path of least resistance, quite candidly, um, was through the, the life insurance industry. So I spent five years uh, really cutting my teeth and getting my graduate education and doing a master's in financial services and all the other things while I was uh, starting a, a life insurance practice and doing um, some asset management, but not really financial planning. Right. And uh, five years later, I had the opportunity to be the, the junior guy in a, in a startup financial planning firm and jumped at it and helped start a company from the ground up. And in 2003, started my own firm, and we've grown from a, um, you know, from my practice with one full and one part-time employee to now having 21 employees in, in three states and having clients in 31 states in the U.S. So it's it's been a wild, wild ride since 2003. That's pretty awesome. So, what is it that that gets Eric up in the morning and gets him fired up about you know the, the financial planning? I mean, some of it is just knowing the, the impact that we're having on people. I, I love that aha moment where I'm sitting down with folks who uh, maybe I'm sitting down with for the first or second time, and we're starting to, to share some of the findings that we've done in the analysis. It's almost like if you were to, to do a physical exam for somebody and you looked at everything and then you came back and said, I think I know why your back hurts. There's something really amazing about, uh, about doing a, a financial exam, uh, a physical exam financially, and then coming back and saying, here are the pain points. I think these are the areas we should concentrate on. And the aha moments and the sense of relief and sometimes the tears or even giddiness and laughter in the room, it's so human. It is so um, unique a relationship because money's taboo. You know, we don't talk about it growing up. You, uh, you don't talk about it with your parents. Um, sometimes you don't know what your parents are, are worth, whether they're leaving you money or costing you money at the end of their road. And, and so ultimately, it's not something you learn in school. It's not something you learn at home. So where do you get the, the basic education? And unfortunately, for many, many years, it was either the school of hard knocks, do it yourself, or it was getting advice from somebody who, even like myself early in my career, was selling product. And that was the, the path into the industry. And I'm so glad the industry is changing as much as it has, though it still has some ways to go, that now it is really about advice and relationships and counsel. Um, and it's, it's more along the lines of, of being um, a being relationship driven far less transactional than it was 30 years ago. Right. So, I mean, a lot of what I hear, hear you saying is education. And it sounds like, you know, you really try to educate you know, your clients on not just their financials, but also kind of what else that they can do. How did you get into the, the um, 
you know, the teaching side of things. Well, some of that comes back to the English major too. I had actually done student teaching and, and uh, going all the way back, even to my high school years, I was doing some student teaching. I always loved to teach. Uh, and I had a chance at uh, Stevenson University, which used to be Villa Julie College at the time. I'm going back a ways, but uh, at Villa Julie, I was adjunct faculty and I was teaching the certified financial planner uh, practitioner curriculum to grad students. Okay. And so I was a college professor, adjunct professor. I love to teach. Um, and now I get to not only teach clients, but I get to mentor and coach young people. So we have, we have eight financial advisors in our office, um, only one over 50, although I'll be the second this year, don't tell anyone. Uh, and, and ultimately, um, we do have a young team and these, these, these folks are sponges. They want to learn everything. Our clients come to the table uh, with very little financial literacy education. None of it's formal. Right. And so I've gotten involved with the financial literacy coalitions and with our comptroller's office and pushing, trying to get financial literacy education in schools. It's a really tough uh, legislative slog, um, but I've been working with Junior Achievement and other organizations bringing financial literacy on a nonprofit basis. And I just think it's impossible to reach financial independence or financial freedom without at least some financial literacy. You don't have to be an expert. None of us have to be Warren Buffett but you do have to have the basics. You, you know, it's real important. If you can't figure out a credit card statement or how to balance a checkbook, you're, you're not likely to be building meaningful, sustainable wealth. Right. I mean, I, I will say I was lucky enough back when, when I was in high school uh, that they offer bookkeeping classes. And that's how I got my first uh, take into, you know, accounting and taxes. And at that point, to me, that was my, oh, this is what I'm going to do. Um, so it kind of kind of different there, um, but I think the education is so important, and that's what we try try to constantly teach our clients is here. Let me try to educate you on some of this, you know, especially when it comes to financial reading financial statements, um, their profit and loss and stuff, is to get them to understand it. Because if they understand it, then they're going to know how to uh, be able to to keep expenses down and, and the right things to look at. So in your teaching, you know, you've written a couple books, you know, uh, the, the latest book is uh, Don't Retire, Graduate. And tell us about the book. I mean, I've started reading it and to me, it's, it's fascinating because it's, it's in layman's terms and it seems very, you know, very simple, but very powerful. Well, I, Gary, I, I specifically wanted it to be easy to read. Nobody wants to read a, a textbook full of jargon. Um, even, even for professional education, it's not fun right. to read that. So I, I wanted something that was relatable, um, something that was in a lay person's terms, even something in first person. I mean, this, this is, um, I, I hope, not preachy at all. It's just um, transparent and authentic. So um, the idea of transforming a graduation or creating a graduation out of what's currently called retirement started, uh, it started many, many years ago for me, where I realized that people were, who were retiring were not thriving. They weren't happy. You know, you, you, this, yep. this idea of spending 50, 60, 70 hours a week doing something, and then suddenly not having that, um, and trying to then figure out what I'm going to do today. And people stopped getting out of bed every morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they really didn't thrive. And even if you are fortunate enough to have built financial independence, you know, your quote unquote retirement years could be a third of your life and half of your adult life. You better have more to do than, than daytime TV and crossword puzzles and, and around a golf because uh, you, you will be bored out of your mind. You will, you will stop thriving. You will stop growing. And I think education should be a continuum. Um, and I, I think being financially independent is a great goal. And this book is a path to financial independence, starting basically wherever you are, whether you're starting and you're 23 and you've got student loans that are piling up on you or whether you're 72 and you're trying to figure out how to take inventory and, and how to make your money last, right. you know, and, and sort of everybody in between. So um, the idea is that retirement in its present sense, which is to, to disappear, retreat or, or withdraw is a fate worse than death. And we should look at it like graduating to the next phase of our lives. And that might mean consulting. It might mean part-time work. It might mean continuing to work because you love it as opposed to you have to. Right. Anything we do for fun, we're going to like more than something we feel like we have to do to, to make ends meet. Right. 
And so it's about figuring out what's more important than money. Uh, and I've discovered over the years wh what I'll refer to and, and in the book refer to as the three secrets of the happiest retirees. And one of them is being debt free. It's being financially independent. It's not feeling like you're, you're, you're stuck on that treadmill. Um, the second one is to maintain your health. In the absence of, of health and the, the ability to thrive uh, physically and, other, and mentally in other ways, all the money in the world doesn't matter at that moment. Um, and the third is purpose. This idea that you've got to have a reason to get out of bed every morning. And the same way you ask me, what gets me excited to get out of bed? Right. I'm excited getting out of bed to get other people out of bed. <laughs> you, you know, right. it's, it's this self-fulfilling prophecy of how can, we, how can we make sure that the next year or two or 10 or 30 are rewarding and that there are stories you can tell and, and experiences you can have. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny that you talk about that in that manner, but anytime I have a, a client who's getting ready to retire, it's first thing, I, what are you gonna do? It's like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the one who's planning your financial retirement, but I'm the one who's talking to you about, what are you gonna do? That's right. Because, you know, you know, Betty's been at home is, uh, you know, a homemaker for, you know, 30 years. And now you're going to put yourself into that, into that same environment. She's got her routine that she does type thing. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's one of those things that, that lots of times, you know, they kind of sit back and say, wow, you're right. So I think that that's interesting that you have that, uh, have that in the book. In here, you talk about you know, being a freshman, being a sophomore and so forth, you know, explain, you know, why you, why you did it this way. Well, because sometimes the path of financial independence is one that is um, linear. It's chronological. There's certain things that you do kind of like putting one step ahead of the other when you walk. So, you know, you're going to experience your first home and maybe your first relationship or marriage or what have you in your first child before you ever have your second or third or fourth one. So, this idea that there are milestones in life that create tipping points and transition points where you have to make big decisions. Mm -hmm. And so we begin with folks who are getting their first job. Do you remember you got your first job and you got an employee benefit sign up package and it was, it was 150 pages long. You didn't know what you were looking at and you chose all the wrong stuff. Right. Um, and I was in that boat and I, what did I do? Well, I didn't have a financial advisor, had no financial acumen. I went to my dad who may or may not have been the right person to go to at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you make these decisions that have lasting impacts on you at an early age. So I consider that your freshman year. Your freshman year is where you're doing a lot of these things for the first time. You're figuring out your finances. You're figuring out cash flow and basic risk management and basic insurance and basic employee benefits. And it really is sort of the blocking and tackling before you get to the point where you're, you're doing some things that are a little more advanced. Sophomore year is, is, is housing and relationships and maybe children and maybe learning um, in earnest how to invest. How do you start accumulating wealth? Junior year, that's, your, that's your, your spot to be in your peak earning years. The junior year is your 45 to 60. You're making more money than you've ever made in your life if, you, if your career is, uh, has you go in that direction. You've got tax issues that you hadn't had before. You've got your parents getting older you have to worry about. You've got your kids and potentially dealing with college and other really big. I mean, they are the highest income, highest tax, and highest expense years of your life, and they're complicated, and you're busy. So that's junior year, and it's, it's much like when you've chosen a major. Like, how am I going to direct all of these different courses, all of these different things into a, a final plan? And then I consider senior year to be um, the capstone. It's your thesis. It's figuring out. Um, what decisions have to be made to reach financial independence? How do we convert from accumulating to creating income? How do we make sure we can't outlive our money? Right. How do we make sure that we've covered the, the what ifs and, and, and sort of navigated around the icebergs financially? How do we make the one-time elections that must get made? Your pension election, if you're fortunate to have one of those, Medicare, Social Security, all these really complicated things that come together all at once. And, uh, and, and so by the time you get there, the last semester and into postgrad is all about what's more important than money. How do you leave a legacy? Um, and, and we talk about things that are, it's much more than a bucket list. Gary, this isn't about saying, here are the five things I want to do before I die. I want to see the Sphinx. 
Well, that's great. But if you've only put five things on a bucket list and you're done them, what are you going to do? Right. So it's more than that. It's more than a bucket list. It's really about creating and maintaining an identity because I'll bet, and I'm putting you on the spot, but I'll bet you when somebody says, Gary, tell me about yourself. One of the first things you say is I'm an accountant. We're all guilty of that. Right. But that's not who you are. It's what you do. And maybe you love it and it's in your blood and it's part of what you, but it's still what you do. And if you do that for 45 years and then somebody says, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm retired. Conversation's over. Right. That doesn't make sense. How about uh, I'm a father or a grandfather or a volunteer or, um, or I'm a consultant or I'm doing all of these exciting things and, and it's different than, well, I'm retired. I'm just sort of sitting around. So you talk about, um, you know, to, you talk about graduating instead of re, uh, instead of to instead of retreating into retirement. So explain the, the difference there. Well, I think that the difference really is, are you advancing toward the next chapter of your life or are you ending arguably the, the, a working chapter of your life? If you look at the definition to retire, which is to retreat or disappear in the UK, to retire means to go to sleep. Um, you know, to me, those things are not things to celebrate. I mean, no. we, not forever. That's, that's a terrible thing. And so I quote some really interesting, I hope, interesting folks in the book. And one of them is Bobby Bowden, who used to coach football at Florida State. Mm -hmm. And he was constantly being pressured. When are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? And he says, I, you know, quite frankly, he says, I, I don't want the next milestone on my, on my list to be my own death. Because once you retire, what else is there? Right. Um, it, it doesn't make sense. He was in his 80s when he stopped coaching. You know, and so if you can live a life of abundance and if you can live a life of meaning and purpose, there's no reason to quit what you're doing just because you hit some random number that the government said, now you can collect something, 62, 67, 70. Why not work till you're 83 because you love it and create a rhythm of your life where you're working three days a week or you're working six months a year where you're working from your beach house in Naples, where whatever it is, like, right. why does it have to be all or nothing? You know, and you, you hear stories about people who, who are afraid to die at their desk. Uh, it, you know, interestingly enough, I wouldn't want to die at my desk because I, because I was working for that next rent check. Right. But I want to die still having a desk. Mm -hmm. So I still want to have something to do. And, and it, it means planning well ahead. You can't just retire because it's December 31st or whatever year I'm retired. And then January, I'll figure out what I want to do. It takes several years in advance, not just oh, forget the financials, the financials are, that's my job. I can help with those. Right. But the things people have to do on their own is to figure out what are the things that are going to keep them um, engaged. Where are they going to live? Are they near their hobbies, their friends, their family, um, healthcare? all the kinds of things that matter. Do they need the space? Can they age in place? Are they in a, a house with four sets of stairs that will eventually be a problem? Right. And, and how do they want to deal with that? Um, do they have grandchildren who are in Albuquerque and they still live in St. Louis and they're wondering, why are we here? We should be in New Mexico. You know, and so I, I think there's this, this process of determining what you want to be when you grow up. And we stop asking people that when they're about eight. And right. I don't know about you, but when you were a kid and somebody said, Gary, what do you want to be when you grow up? You said, I want to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. I want to play pro football. I want to do something, whatever it was. I doubt right. you said accountant at eight. No. You may have, but most Definitely don't. Not. <laughs> but if I asked you right now, what do you want to be when you grow up? The first response I get from most people is like a chuckle, but it's a nervous chuckle. It's like, man, nobody's asked me that in 50 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And it's an awesome question to ask somebody and an even better one to figure out an answer to. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I have a daughter who's 11 and I've already told her not to grow up because adulting's a trap in, in the beginning exactly. in, to begin with. Um, but in, in so much as we can't stop getting older, we can choose whether and how we want to grow up. And that means finding something that we love and going towards it, not running away from it. I feel sorry for people who are in jobs they can't wait to get out of. That's tragedy. Now, in your book, you talk about that um, building financial freedom at any age. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for people that are in their 50s that have maybe gone through a divorce or because of COVID, 
they they lost their business and they're starting over again. What advice do you have for them? Well, the, the first step is always the hardest because sometimes it means acknowledging where you are and figuring out what you need to do first. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the time, anytime you're going to try and save or accumulate money, think of it like filling a bucket with water. The first thing you have to do is make sure there's no hole in the bottom of the bucket or right. you're wasting your energy. So that means deal with things like debt, um, things like, um, like a negative cash flow. You know, if you're spending more than you make, it doesn't matter what you earn. If you earn a million dollars a year and you're spending a million two, you're not building wealth. You're going backwards. Right. So it starts with debt and with cash management, no matter how old you are. Then as you start to, to build some wealth, there are steps that I, that I suggest in the book. And actually each chapter of the book is a module. It's got its own extra credit assignment because I don't know about you, but nobody likes homework and everybody does extra credit. Right. So there's an extra credit assignment and we're actually putting out a workbook that will be the collection of extra credit assignments to, to get people to work through these kinds of things. And essentially it's like building your own financial plan at your own pace with your own thought process. But, you know, one of the steps, the very first step is the pay yourself first step that this isn't a new concept. People have, have understood that that's a, a, an important strategy but so few people do it and to be accountable to pay yourself like it's the first bill every month matters. So whether you're 25 or 65, if you're earning a hundred thousand dollars a year and you know, you need to put away 18% of it to hit your financial independence target, that first 18,000 a year had better go into something that's growing for you. What you do with the other 82% is up to you. I'm not going to force somebody to go on a budget. Nobody likes budgets. I don't, if you want to, if you want to eat at the Capitol grill, just don't go every night, go occasionally. Right. Some people would rather spend a, a whole lot of money on a dinner once a month and other people want to eat out every night, in which case it better not be the same caliber restaurant. Right. I, it, it, to me, it's not about how you spend the money that you have available to spend. It's about making sure that you only spend up to that limit whereby everything else has already gone to the things it needs to, no matter how old you are. Now, how do, how do you advise, you know, you talk about pay, pay yourself first. Yeah. How do you advise doing that? I mean, are we setting up a separate bank account that this goes to? Or are we setting up an investment account that it goes to? How do you do this so you don't stick your hand in the cookie jar? Well, first, it requires some, some self-discipline because almost anything we put money into, we can find a way to get to. Right. Um, and as you know, as a CPA, a lot of them are disastrous ways to get to money, but people do them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would say that the risk management part of this first is to build the emergency fund and have the right cash cushion or dry powder so that in the event there's a, um, either a tragedy or an opportunity, but usually it's some kind of threat. Um, where you suddenly need five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars for a surprise, you need a driveway or a roof or something goes wrong with your car or whatever it is, that you don't have to turn to Visa to get it, and you don't have to pull money out of an IRA prematurely, or you don't have to sell securities and pay capital gains that might not be good timing, or uh, you know. So first, it's building that first um, moat around your castle, which is having some cash. Cash is still important. You don't want too much but you need enough that you can survive six months of unemployment for example. Beyond that, then you start figuring out the, the investing and do, do you invest in capital gains property? Are you eligible for a retirement plan? Is there a match on your retirement plan? You know, to, to almost at any, in any situation, there are very few I can think of where someone shouldn't at least put enough money in their company retirement plan to, to get the full match. Hmm. That, that, that is as close to free money as free money comes unless you're changing jobs every 18 months and you never vest in anything. Right. So there's that. Um, there's also the concept that a lot of people struggle with, which is um, it's like the airplane safety lecture, which is to put your own mask on first before you right. secure for others. People near bankrupt themselves paying for their kids to get educated and then never hit financial retirement uh, and, and independence. So I think it's real important that we take care of ourselves first, not because we're being selfish, but because we're being uh, independent and self-supporting. And so then you can help your parents, your kids, your, your next door neighbor, if it makes you happy, but you got to make sure that you're solid first, or you're going to wind up having to live with one of your kids. And so I, I do think this starts at, at an early age. I do think there, there are investment strategies here about portfolio design and asset allocation and all those kinds of things. It's all here. It, it's so much less important 
which growth fund you choose than it is how much you put away every month and that you do it re you know, regularly and religiously. That, you know, I spend very little time talking about things like selecting securities, because quite frankly, that's easy to outsource. A computer can do that for you. Right. You don't have to be an expert at picking any security ever. It's real important to understand why you're putting away $100 a month or 300 or 500 or whatever the, the, the math. It's real important to know why you're putting that away and what you need to earn on that in order to have work be optional at such and such a time. Right. You know, in, I guess, going back to, you know, you said the emergency fund, how much, um, how much do you suggest? I mean, you, you threw out six months. I mean, is that, is that your, your suggestion or? I, I think it depends a, a lot on a couple of things. One, is there one or two um, wage earners in the household? Okay. Because in a situation where you've got a married couple and one is working and one is a stay home mom or dad, um, you run a much greater risk of an unemployment event with one job than you do with two jobs, where it's unlikely necessarily you'd both be laid off simultaneously. Um, so typically, I would say at least three months um, should be in cash or something easy to get to like cash. Um, now, that's not three months of your gross. That's not three months of how much you make. It's three months of how much you have to spend. Mm -hmm. So if you're making, if you're making $10,000 a month, throwing this out, you make $10,000 a month and three of it goes to taxes. Now you're at 7,000 and your savings rate is 2000 a month. You're putting away 2000 a month, the savings, then what you're spending is $5,000. That 5,000 is what you need at least three months. If you're both working, um, and six months, if only one of you is working, unless, unless you own the company and, and the possibility of a of a, um, unemployment is virtually nil. So I think it starts at three. And before you do any of that, it's real important to, to make sure you're not also in debt, you know, making excess payments to debt. And I don't mean mortgages, anything that's leveraged mortgage or a, or a business loan to, to start a company or, uh, or something where you're borrowing because it's creating wealth. That's totally different than, than buying that set of skis, um, and paying for them on, on MasterCard for the next three years. Right. So consumer debt as a whole is virtually always bad. Um, loans against 401ks, student loans, all those kinds of things for the most part are, are not favorable. Um, and so excess payments toward that counts toward your savings rate. So if you're 24 and you say, my gosh, I'd love to put away $1,000 a month, but I've got, I've got $400 of student loan payments to make. If you were to pay double your student loan payment, hypothetically, that is already starting to build wealth, even if it's just shoring up the hole in the bucket. Right. You got to start there or, it, or nothing else matters. And that, you know, that's your advice on this. So in that situation, you have that young, young student, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, 23 years old, mm -hmm. you know, they have to start paying on their, on their uh, student loans. And you're saying, Hey, you know, if you can double up on it, but we, as they're doing that, do you still recommend them putting into a 401k or uh, a Roth IRA or something like that? It, it's a great question. And, and some of it depends on the, the amount of debt, the income trajectory. I mean, if you're, if you're in debt because you're uh, going to be a, 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 a neurosurgeon, that might be different than if you're in debt because you're in uh, elementary education. Right. So, so some of it is going to be about earning potential. But to the extent that you're getting a match, I think you still want to do the 401k or 403b or whatever it is because you're getting that extra money. Um, I, I think in terms of the Roth... I, it depends on the interest rates, but generally, I'd rather see you chip away at the debt than do almost anything else. Okay. Um, and and so I would say if you're if you're getting the match from your from your employer, and you're building an emergency fund, and you're paying down your debt at 23, that's what's expected of you. That's what you that that would be an ideal scenario. Well, ideal would be you don't have debt in the first place. Well, it, true, true. You know, I keep telling my daughter scholarship scholarship i tell it to her when she's sleeping scholarship <laughs> <laughs> hey whatever works right uh, well we'll see give me seven years i'll tell you all about it <laughs> yeah. i get i have i have one right ahead of you and one right behind you so uh -huh. I, I i'm right there with you it is it is crazy to think about um you know what what education costs right now and what it buys you yeah. are are becoming disjointed and, yes. and I, I do think there will be some give back and some changes in higher ed that are profound in the coming years. I just don't know if they'll get here before or after my daughter matriculates, Right, but we'll see. 
So you have a lot of advice. We could go on for probably three more hours about, you know, uh, what, what the next steps are throughout the book. Um, at this point, can you give our listeners how they can get a hold of, hold of your book and, and start reading? Because I'm sure a lot of them want to jump into this now. Sure. The book is available at Amazon it's at, and any place where you buy books online at Don't Retire, Graduate. Um, there's a podcast by that same name, and you can find all of that at BrotmanMedia.com. Um, or you can check out our firm at BFGFA.com. Uh, and lastly, I would throw out there are um, there are a couple of free resources that we that we have shared with the public about what financial planning is and some some that you'll like, Gary, about taxes and how to pay less taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you go to financialplanningforall.com, so that's financialplanningforall.com, you'll get to a series of resources, some of which are free. If you want to schedule a call with me, I'd love it. Um, and we can have a conversation about where you are and see if, if, uh, if we can help. What haven't I asked you that you would like our listeners to know? You know, I, I think, first of all, I think you've, it's been great. You've, you've touched on a lot of topics, both in the book and in the practice. Um, I would say, what's the first step, you know, and, and ask what the first step was to any type of plan. It always starts with inventory and figuring out where you are. So it's, it's kind of like if you were going to build a, a map and you know sort of where you want to go, but you don't know where you are, you have no possible means to get there. Right. So if I were asked, what is the first step? The first step is a full and transparent inventory. And that means for you and your spouse or prospective spouse, um, be very transparent, be very open and, um, and make sure you really know where things are. It's, it's like a file cabinet that we put things in and never look at again. And so many mistakes are made by virtue of the little things, the asset titling or the beneficiary designation or elections that were made when you had one child and now you have two. Right. And so, you know, I would say really know where you are before you try and go anywhere because it's, it is um, extremely difficult to build a path when you don't know where point A is. Eric, we really appreciate your time today. Um, you know, you've been a wealth of knowledge. And like you said, I think our, our listeners, uh, really should pick up this book no matter where they are in their in their retirement process, even if they are retired Absolutely. already. I think that this would be uh, a great book for them to pick up and, and, and read. So today our guest has been Eric Brotman with BFG Financial, and we appreciate your time. Gary, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.